The helicopter is made of carbon fiber, a composite material lighter and stronger than steel, protected by two layers of green plastic. The fiber is cut with a blade controlled by ultrasound. They lay on several thicknesses of fiber to make the rear fuselage. The green light of a laser helps position the parts. Then with the heat gun, they apply a beehive web, which increases the solidity of the structure. But the carbon fiber is still soft. To harden, it must be washed under pressure for 10 hours in this autoclave oven at 177 degrees centigrade. The pieces exit the oven and head for machining. The door of the motor housing is kept in a cutting jig and is shaped with a manual shaper. Before installing the parts in place, they strike it with a resonance hammer to detect any faults. Next, the electrical harness is mounted on a pattern before being installed in the aircraft. This particular helicopter has 2,351 meters of wiring, but others can have almost 9 kilometers. The wiring will be connected to the flight instruments panel, the brain of the helicopter. This aircraft has 9,964 rivets, fastened with a gun and a ram. They also apply a sealant to prevent the infiltration of corrosion creating humidity. They now assemble the helicopter's rear fuselage. Piece by piece, the aircraft takes shape. They will install mechanical components later. The motor arrives. This one weighs 120 kilos and has to be carefully handled. Among the other parts to be installed is the circular plate on which the blades will be attached. Safety is primary. The screw nut holes are perforated allowing the insertion of the brake cable. This tightly braided metal wire prevents the nut from loosening due to strong vibrations. Now they bolt on the four blades which make the helicopter fly. Weighing 41 kilos each, they're made of composite materials and an aluminum alloy. They're attached to the main rotor. The dashboard is installed in the cockpit and all the wires are hooked up. Contact is established and all is functioning properly. Nothing remains but finishing the interior of the craft. They install seats, safety belts, the consoles, bulkheads, windows and doors, as well as the trimmings. The helicopter is almost completed, but it still has to be painted.
This shape delays the point at which the pressure waves form as the tips approach the speed of sound. So the helicopter can travel faster before serious vibration sets in. In fact, Abdul Noir's design is so good that for once the factor limiting the 139's top speed is not the blades. It's the strength of the windscreen. Abdel Noir also improved the carrying capacity of the blades to match the brute force of the engines by widening the main section. The high carrying capacity of the 139 was made possible thanks to the broad footprint of the blade. He made the blade strong enough to carry 6.8 tons, including the weight of the helicopter and its load, which can be up to 15 passengers or two and a half tons of equipment. The main rotor is made up of five blades, each made from composite materials, maximizing strength for low weight. And is held in place by just two titanium bolts. It is important that they're mounted correctly, otherwise there are risks of damaging the blade. And in the worst case, though it's very unlikely, we could lose a blade. And that's not a good thing for a helicopter. <laughs> With the blades fitted, the helicopter, while not complete, is now a working aircraft. And it's time to prepare it for flight. Switching on for the first time is always a tense time. Test engineer Gianluca Frattini needs absolute confidence in his colleagues that have designed and built this complex machine. He carries out all the standard pre-flight checks that any pilot would do before a flight with extra care. We check there are no anomalies, that there is no dust in the air filters, there are no oil or fuel leaks. Then we have a look at the top part of the helicopter, check there's nothing wrong with the rotor, and check it's all okay. Satisfied that it's all okay, Gianluca tracks down a pilot. But there's a lot more testing and checking to do before this beast flies. This time in close proximity to fast-moving, newly-fitted blades. Even though it's built to microscopic tolerances, this is a high-performance machine that needs tuning, just like a racing car. And this one needs a surprisingly low-tech tweak. The vibrations are over the limit. The rotor's out of balance. The tail blades are color-coded and Gianluca's instruments indicate it's the red one that needs attention. It's a procedure very similar to balancing the wheel of a car. A length of wire, three 10-gram tungsten beads, and a plastic tube is all you need. As the vibration in the tail rotor is over the acceptable limit, I need to put some weights inside the cotter. We'll then run the test again and see if it solves the problem. The adjustments are perfect, the rotor's fixed. We can proceed with other tests now. Problem sorted, and this brand new 139 is approved for flight. The goal of building a go-anywhere, do-anything helicopter has all but been achieved. But to be a success and revive the company's fortunes, one challenge remains.
the 139 must sell to a very wide range of customers. So once a helicopter has been flight tested, it goes back to the flight line to be tailored to each customer's needs. Product manager Tommaso Coley is overseeing the customization of 10 different helicopters for his clients. To my right, you can see a helicopter that's destined to be a VIP carrier. The fuselage is instantly recognizable because it has a hinge door instead of a sliding door. In this machine, you can see that we've installed an active anti-vibration. There are three boxes. Basically, there are blocks that are moved electronically to cancel out the natural vibration of the helicopter. This is a system that's unique to the 139, and it's much appreciated by our VIP clients. This transmission is designed just for the VIP version. It has a system that reduces noise and vibration to give a more comfortable flight than the other models. With many customization features now in place, the helicopter is effectively complete. So it's time to take it apart again for painting. The painting period is a long one and very complex because the machine gets here and firstly gets painted with a special primer that protects the helicopter. After that, more coats are applied, depending on the design and colour that the client has chosen. Back on the flight line, the painted fuselage is reassembled and the final level of customization takes place. Mountain rescue helicopters get their skis, police choppers get cameras, and VIPs get their luxury interiors. This particular machine is destined for a cold country, so it's been given a very special added extra. The 139 is the only machine of its kind that has a de-icing system. This system is made up of generators that produce electricity, which is sent to the blades, in order to warm them up. The system is triggered automatically by sensors that check the speed of the ice formation, or the pilot can activate it manually by looking at the amount of ice building up on this ball. At the far end of the flight line is a room reserved for handshakes and champagne. This is where completed helicopters are handed over to their new owners. Today it's the turn of an offshore machine and the clients have come a long way to pick up the keys. My whole team here flew all the way from Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia to collect the, uh, the last helicopter. Today is the crowning glory of the whole building process. So it's a very emotional moment that involves a number of people, and especially the top management and obviously the client. 